I wanted to ask you, how do you classify patients when they come in, or how do you prognosticate for patients when they, they first meet you and you work them up? Yes. Um, so we have all struggled with how to classify myelodysplastic syndrome since the late 70s. In 1976, the French, American, British hematologists got together and proposed the FAB classification, which was prevalent for many years until the World Health Organization uh, uh, hematopathologists uh, built upon that original FAB classification and refined it to a large degree. And this WHO classification then eventually replaced uh, the FAB classification. But right. still, the WHO or, a, or FAB was not giving us an idea about the prognosis of a patient. So then the scoring system was developed, International Prognostic Scoring System, first developed in 1997. And this took into account, of course, uh, three parameters. Uh, what is the percentage of blasts? What are the number of cytopenias? And what are the cytogenetics? Three parameters simply because no one parameter was able to uh, accurately give us a prognosis. But despite all of these scoring systems and classification, James, the problem is that all of this is dependent on prognosticating for the population as a whole, which means you, you have a curve here. So even in this curve, you can say that 50% of the people will survive for 3.5 years. Right. But then within that curve, there's a third that will be dead within before and a, a third that will be living for up to 20 years. So when an individual is sitting across my uh, desk from me in the clinic and I try to apply these systems to the individual, it becomes very challenging because then I don't know which third of the curve this <coughs> patient is going to be yeah. occupying. And so to use any of these classification systems and tell the patient an act, a, a, a very exact, precise sounding number like your survival is right. likely to be 2.3 or 2.7 years, I think is a gross uh, disservice to the patient because it in no way can reflect an individual's prognosis. Oh, I, I completely agree. I, I don't think that that's always that meaningful for a person to hear an actual number, a specific number, because of the, I'll say the confidence intervals around those are so wide. You know, obviously with the revised IPSS or the revised scoring system from three years ago, um, at least we get more information on the role of the CBC itself where it appreciates how low the ANC is, it appreciates how low the platelets are, and it helps discriminate a little more finely. The cytogenetic grouping is a little more uh, discriminating as well. So I think we can hone it down a little better, but I, I still feel that's kind of a holy grail for us to determine for an, for an individual rather than for a population what's their prognosis and what the right strategy would be. I'd like to add to, to that that uh, the revised IPSS system again takes the same three parameters right. and looks at them with a little more detail. So for example, the blast percentage is now divided into um, 0 to 2 percent, 3 to 5 percent, 5 to 10, 10 to 20. Right. Well, one man's ceiling is another man's floor. One pathologist counts 2 percent and another is going to count 3 percent, and that changes the score in this system, which I think is within the range of human error, that kind of counting. No, I agree. I do teach our fellows that nothing magical happens when the blast count goes from 9 percent to 10 percent, yes. and that's, some, that's somewhat arbitrary. So that's an excellent point. That's, yes. that's not a definitive thing. It's yes. more of a... So what More I do, James, yeah. in my actual practice, which right. is, I think, practically speaking, that's very important for our colleagues to understand right. that the way you are going to assign prognosis to an individual can only be right now by following their disease and the natural history of their disease. So when a patient is diagnosed, please do not rush in to start instituting therapies because what looks like a very serious anemia with one transfusion can improve and then remain improved for the next six months. And you don't have to start a disease-modifying drug immediately for such a patient. So my advice is, especially for lower-risk MDS patients, 
at diagnosis, just follow them for a while with supportive care measure only so that you get some idea about what their natural history is going to look like. And again, apply that rule of punctuated equilibrium. You don't know how long they're going to last right. in that equilibrium state before the next event happens. I was going to use that very term. I'm, I'm going to borrow that term if that's okay with you. Well, I borrowed it from Stephen Jay Gould, so you're my <laughs> guest. So, my well, guess. okay, so he's smarter than I am. Okay. Um, well, no, I, I, at a recent presentation, somebody asked me, what are the two pearls that you would want somebody to know in MDS? And the first pearl was really mirroring what you said, which is the first is you have to be patient. You have to be patient to confirm the diagnosis, see the evolution of the disease, and see if your interventions or transfusions are, are working. And the second is you actually have to monitor transfusion support. And I don't think that's done consistently in practice where we know if there's a change in the transfusion burden, for instance, or a change in ferritin over time, or really a de deterioration of the CBC until somebody flags it in practice. So that, that's the other innovation I would have recommended. I really like your point about being patient. I think that's a critical, a critical one.